Well, good morning. My name is Alex Fernandez. I'm one of the pastors here at Cornerstone, the pastor here at the Heritage Hill campus. Welcome to all of you who are present here. Welcome to everybody who is joining us online. Just a couple of announcements. I heard Scotty mention our prize at the beginning. We are in the middle of a wonderful festival here in our city. We've got great, exciting news that five of the artists here were in the top 100 at the midpoint. So let's give that a round of applause. We'll tell you in the nine years, we've never had one in the top 100. So that's cool that we have five here and I see a few of them sitting here. So uh, take it in. We, uh, we've had almost 1,000 people walk through our buildings in the last week. So that's cool. Um, that's good too. Yeah. Uh, and then also confirmation begins today. Confirmation is our profession of faith that we have for young people. It's a six-month long process. It starts today if you have an eighth, ninth, tenth grader, somewhere in that range. Uh, and you have not signed up for confirmation. It is not too late. It starts today, but they really kick off hardcore next weekend. So you can go out and sign up for that. I really encourage uh, that for a young person in your life uh, that's going to have somebody mentor them over the next six months to help them define what their faith is. Not your faith, not what your family's faith is, not what uh, your history of family believes, but what they believe. And so it's an incredible process. We have great mentors who are ready to pour into them. Okay, jumping into the message today, I was thinking back uh, about 20 years ago, the auto industry invented something that saved my children's lives. And that was the DVD player that was installed into, <laughs> into, uh, the, into cars in 2003. I bought, we bought our first minivan. It was an Oldsmobile silhouette. It came standard with a DVD player. And uh, I say that facetiously, but you know, that my kids at the time were like seven and five and any journey in the car was an instant fight. The poking, the touching, don't give me any, all that kind of stuff. And you know, really you know, their lives were in danger at some point uh, because it was just getting hectic. And so the DVD player in the vehicle all of a sudden changed everything in the car. Like our family tension went down when the headphones went on and the screen went down. We had to actually come up with processes of who got to pick what. I think you probably have walked through that. Like who got to pick what you're going to watch. Uh, but it, it started, though, a pattern uh, that also became unhealthy, that while there was peace in the car and all that kind of stuff, finally for the first time, like every time we got in the car, we had to throw in a DVD player, right? And, and so even if it was like a three-minute ride, there was just a dependency on getting that on, getting, a, getting the headphones on. Some of you can relate to that. It also turned into, like, I can't watch or I can't eat if I'm not watching something. I know that's something that, that families today with the iPads and are struggling with today. We like build these patterns in. Some of them can be healthy. Some of them can provide some relief from stress. Uh, some of them become dependency. Uh, and so we've been talking about patterns. We all have them. When I say patterns, we're talking about habits. Uh, we have good ones, we have bad ones. Some are, some are just kind of arbitrary. They just are patterns. Uh, an American, a study on American culture just a couple years ago uh, discovered that 96% of people put peanut butter on their peanut butter and jelly sandwiches first. Does that sound right? It means only 4% do the jelly. How many jelly first people in the crowd? It's a couple. You're wrong, but it says, it says okay. <laughs> like overwhelmingly, 96% of us get it right. You guys will figure it out at some point. The same study found, this is interesting too, because it goes along with the percentages that when it comes to filling up your gas tank or putting more fuel, just more fuel in your car, 50% of people do it when it gets down to halfway full. A quarter of people, 25%, wait till it gets to a quarter full. And then there's a quarter that are like me that waits for that light to go on. That's the notice. I mean, I am not making this story up. Yesterday, I left the house, had to run a few errands, had to go just to run around a few different places. I got in the car, I said I had 14 miles. And I passed four gas stations on the way to my first stop, got back into my car, and all of a sudden, when I turned on the car, it said zero. And it was two more, I knew it was two more miles to find the next gas station. And on my way, as I'm white knuckling it, my prayer was simply this. God, please don't make me call Beth Ann. <laughs> that was my prayer. That was my prayer. That's the only thing I did not want to call her and admit 
that anybody ever run out of gas? I've done that a few times because I'm one of those people. Bad habit to wait. Um, both of those are examples of neutral things that we build some habits around. Unless you run out of gas, then it's not so neutral. Then it becomes a bad habit. But if you think about the patterns or the habits that you have, no, this is not a show of hands. Um, how many of you have a bad or destructive habit that you know you need to break? I think we all fall into that category. I, I know some people who have a shopping habit that feels harmless until the Amazon truck is pulling into your driveway every single day. Uh, I have a friend uh, who had a gambling habit that turned into a, a terrible addiction that ended up costing him his home and then eventually his marriage. Uh, nobody plans on having painkillers or ac alcohol become an addiction. Nobody plans on having pornography rule over their life. Nobody wants to live an unhealthy lifestyle and, and have medical problems because of the things we do to our body. We don't do those things out of intent. They just, sometimes there's patterns that take us into it. And it could be anything. It could be some, maybe for you, it's, it's a pattern of gossiping uh, in, by the water cooler at work or a pattern of not taking good advice or or allowing things to, to fester up and then blowing up at the people around you. Those can be, all can be patterns. And so if you haven't been with us, we are in a series called Patterns. And we have been looking at uh, two verses uh, that we are walking slowly through. First time we've done this you know, as long as we can remember. Just two verses that the Apostle Paul writes about our patterns and habits. And in week one, we learned that this is, this is both physiological and biological. We are, this is how we're made and how we're wired, that our brains are hardwired to create patterns of repetition so that we don't have to remember everything all the time and relearn things, right? You don't have to look up Google Maps to figure out how to get to work. Your, your, your body, your brain develops a pattern of being able to do that so that you don't have to be guided and relearn that all the time. Speaking of driving, when you, get, when you learn to be a driver, we learn good habits, right? That's what driver's training is all about. We learn about the good habits that, that keep you safe on the road. We, we learn that when we get in the car, we check all of the, 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 check the dash. We walk around the car. We check our mirrors. You, you do those things to build the good patterns and habits, and pretty soon those, th those habits become so, you become so accustomed to that, that they become second nature, and then sometimes we add bad habits to that. We stop checking those things. We pull out of our driveway at 35 miles an hour, not three miles an hour. You know, we start adding things to the things like, that we're doing while we're driving, like eating or looking at things or, or texting. Uh, those have all become bad habits built off of good habits that we have. And so over the first couple of weeks, we have been slowly walking through this. None of these are one specific answer on how to break habits, but the Apostle Paul in these two verses helps us unpack the process to go through that. And the first one was to realize that we have bad habits or just habits in general. That that's how we're made. And he urges us to see that. Last week, we talked about the need to release those bad habits. That, that there's a higher power that, that, that we can release those things to and ask for help. And today we're going to look at the, the second verse, specifically Romans 12, verse 2, that starts off like this. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Those are the verses that, this is the verse we're going to be looking at over the next two weeks, specifically the first part. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. We can easily be tempted to conform. There is a pattern that exists in this world. There are many patterns that this world will, will naturally, we will naturally fall into. It's easy to fall into a pattern, right? That's how we're, we're all made, but that's how this world functions. Uh, one of the, uh, there's lots of different shows uh, that, that are like this, but Candid Camera was a show uh, that, decades ago, in, into the 1970s, did uh, an experiment on people that has been replicated on punk and other, other shows like it over the years, and that was that a person is standing in an, in an elevator, and as it goes to the next floor, the next people come in, and they face the other way in the elevator. Have you ever seen that one? And, and uh, over a series, it didn't matter the person, that as more people got into the elevator, and they're facing 
I'll just say the wrong direction. Everybody knows which way you face in an elevator, right? You face towards the door. Uh, and, and over this experiment, as two people entered, and then the next floor, as another person entered, and, it's, and all of a sudden, this person was the only person facing the way. And you could see the tension in them as they started to look around. You, they wondered to the first people, but as they, they were watching everybody else, eventually they started to slowly do the turn of facing the other way. You can, play, you can do that experiment as a family, I guess, if you want. Uh, but those, those are, that's an example of our desire to conform, to break a pattern that even, doesn't even feel natural. Uh, whether, whether we realize it or not, they're easy to learn. Sometimes we learn patterns from our friends. Uh, we certainly learn uh, patterns that are, are, are happening in the lives of people from our social media. We see different things, that, the trends that, that people are doing, and we want to emulate those things. We, we learn our patterns of behavior from our family. Uh, but God wants us in this passage to understand that he wants to transform our mind. He's talking about the way that we think, Paul is writing about. And so we're going to break that down. Because no matter what your behavior is, no matter what your habit is, especially if it's destructive, uh, there's two ways to deal with the destructive patterns that we learn from Jesus specifically. And the first one is this. Sounds easy, but it's hard. Resist destructive patterns. We need to learn how to resist destructive patterns. Early on in his ministry, there's a story in Scripture. It's a short little story that, that is found in Matthew chapter 4, and it starts like this. It says, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the de desert to be tempted by the devil. Jesus himself faced temptation. Not just that one time, Jesus as also human and also divine, both both fully human, both fully God. There was times where Jesus experienced true human temptation. And this is a story found in Matthew chapter four, a short little story where Jesus, it says, is led by the spirit into the desert to be tempted. What you'll notice in that story is that there's something that happens in Jesus' temptation that we all face that is one of the greatest temptations is that he's alone. He goes off into the wilderness Think about your own temptation. How many times have you fallen into temptation because nobody else is around? How many times have you fallen into temptation because nobody knows what you're doing? How many times have you fallen into temptation because you believe that what you're doing can be kept a secret? How many times have you been in temptation because nobody around you is there to hold you accountable? How many times have you fallen into temptation when you've thought, you know, this is only affecting me? What's the harm? That's the, that's the danger of temptation that Jesus walks into. It's the old adage, idle hands are the devil's workshop. Sometimes when we're alone, sometimes when we have nothing to do is when the greatest temptation shows up. As the story continues, Matthew 4, and he's tempted three different times. Each time, you know, it's a different sermon, but there's a different way that he fights off the temptation. But each time Jesus resists the tempter, and it says, the tempter came to him and said, if you're the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus was hungry. He was off, he was fasting, and Jesus was hungry. He says, tell these stones, you're, you're the son of God, you're the almighty. Turn these stones to bread and eat. And Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan. Circle that in your Bibles. I pray that all the time. Satan, get behind me. Speak it out loud. When, you're, when you are close to temptation, use the authority of the words of scripture of the almighty God to say, Satan, get behind me. Away from me, Satan, Jesus says, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus is resisting temptation in that moment. And notice the temptation. Temptation never sounds like, hey, come over here. I've got something destructive for you to get involved in. <laughs> temptation never sounds like, hey, do you want to ruin your life right now? 
I got something for you to do. Temptation never sounds like that. Temptation sounds like, hey, you are the master of your own domain. You can make decisions for yourself. You, you're, you have a need. Jesus' need in this example is you're hungry. Do what you know you can do. Don't worry about what, uh, what people think. Don't worry about what God is. God's not even here right now. That's what he's hearing. And Jesus says, away from me, Satan, resisting temptation. The Apostle Paul says it this way, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. He says, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. Think about that. Quit, quit feeling sorry for yourself in the temptation, Paul is saying. You face the same temptation that everybody else faces. The sin might be different, the power of the sin might be different, but the temptation is the exact same. Quit blaming other people for your temptation. Everybody goes through temptation. Jesus went through temptation, Paul says. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience, and God is faithful. He will not allow temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is maybe the most misquoted scripture of all verses in the Bible. I have heard people use 1 Corinthians 10, 13 and say, the Bible says, God will not give me more than I can handle. It is not what 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is talking about. Tell that to the person who's had a mental breakdown. Tell that to the person who is going through grief that is crushing their spirit. Being a Christian, being a follower of Christ does not mean the world we are immune to the, the, the tragedy and the disaster and the hardship of this world. We will go through trouble, Jesus says. But Paul says, he will not allow us to be tempted more than we can handle. Our temptation is the same. The promise in scripture is that God will not allow our temptation to be beyond what we can handle. That's a powerful verse. This is a verse to memorize. If you struggle with temptation, if there's addiction, if there's something that's got power over you and has ruled over you, claim this verse. Write this verse down. Memorize this verse. Celebrate this verse. This is truth in the gospel that that. that Sin and temptation have no power and authority over us. We have the ability to resist temptation and even more so, no matter how powerful the temptation has been, no matter how many times you have fallen victim to that temptation, no matter how many times that temptation has remained undefeated against you, it says God will not allow it ever to be so powerful that you can't overcome it. How? Because he will show you a way out. No matter the temptation, God will show you a way. This is the confusing part of the Lord's Prayer, by the way. Lead me not into temptation. You ever wondered what that meant? You ever wondered why, why would God lead me into temptation? It says the Spirit led Jesus into the desert. Does God lead us into temptation? It's an incorrect, it's an incorrect interpretation of, of that phrase. Is that when we are in temptation, it looks like Jesus is alone. It looks like Jesus is alone in this story. But Jesus has the word of God on his heart. Jesus has the word of God in his mind. The spirit is present in that temptation to help Jesus lead him away. Lead me away from temptation. That's the promise. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. God will provide a way out no matter how many times you faced it. Patterns start in our mind. This is how we're wired. These are the scripts that we write in our head. These are the habits that we continue to go back to. Do you know your triggers? 
Do you know the trigger for your temptation that turns it into sin? Sometimes it's the surroundings that we're in. Sometimes it's the places that we put ourselves that become the temptation that is too strong to overcome, that opens the door to sin. Sometimes it's our mental state. I am, when I am weak, when I am tired, that's when I fall into temptation. Sometimes it's our mental state that we, that we go so hard that we are, we're tired and exhausted that we're weak, both mind, body, and soul. That's, do you understand your mental triggers? Sometimes it's the time of day. Sometimes you fall into, if you fall into temptation at two o'clock in the morning, do you know that's a trigger? Sometimes it's our mood. Sometimes it's the people around us. How many people have you ever had to cut off because they're just not good to have around? Sometimes it's people. Could be anything. Could be stress, could be boredom, could be loneliness. All of them are patterns. And Paul's not saying it's easy. It's hard to resist temptation. But we need to ask for the Holy Spirit to help. We have permission to ask God in the temptation to help us resist the temptation and lead us away from temptation. When you know your triggers, do you ask? Here's the second thing we see in Jesus. Is, start, is starting a new practice is important. This is important for anything. It's not just, I mean, pick anything, whether it's unhealthy eating you know, you have to replace unhealthy eating with something else, right? Whatever, whatever it is you're struggling with, if you stop smoking, everybody knows who has stopped smoking. If you don't replace that with something else, you will fall into some other habit. Is it a healthy habit? Ephesians 4, this is Paul's words again. He says, throw off your sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly and righteous and holy. In other words, your old self, we talked about this last week a little bit, your old self has to go away. When you're trying to overcome sin, you know, we have to, we have to start new. That's called a rebirth. It's a rebirth. It's a renewing. And it's a renewing of our mind. That the old self has to go away and new healthy habits have to show up. You know, if you've fallen into a pattern of debt and you're drowning in debt, building a pattern of budget can help you out of that. Again, with health, health if, you're, if you have a healthy, unhealthy li lifestyle. If you're sick, it's too late. But if you build a healthy lifestyle, diet and exercise, that can lead you out of that. And it's not any different spiritually. This is a spiritual battle. Temptation is a spiritual thing. So what are you doing spiritually to build habits that are healthy to start a new practice that unlocks the freedom to overcome temptation? Our Catholic friends calling the, call this developing a rule of life. In our Wesleyan theology, we call these spiritual disciplines. In our, in our Methodist roots, they're the methods. They're the practices of healthy spiritual practices that build in the habit of good practices to replace the bad practices. Let me just give you a few. There's many. Bible reading. Do you have a routine of being in the word of God? Is there a pattern in your life of being in and knowing the word of God? Do you memorize scripture? Is there anything that you're walking around with that you know, for my trigger, this is something that I need to remind myself. It has to be on my mind and written on my heart so that when I hear things that sound good in the world, that I can compare it to something that God is saying that helps me understand and gain perspective. Are you willing to get in a study? I'm gonna keep plugging this. We have a study coming up in a few weeks, starting in October, every Wednesday night, we are gonna be jumping in the book of Galatians. If you're not connected, I encourage you, if you've never been in a study, a Bible study, this is a great start. We're gonna start from the perspective that you don't know anything about the Bible. And I don't care if you know as much as anybody in the Bible, we're gonna start from that perspective and we're gonna wrestle through the words of Galatians that have more relevance to our world today than you possibly know. Because... 
There are patterns, there are bad habits <clears throat> that are forming in our culture and you're gonna see them progress over the next several weeks as we head into an election and there's gonna be natural behaviors of what you are gonna want, how you're gonna to wanna to respond. Galatians is gonna give us a perspective of how to live differently in our culture to be a light of God in this community and the people around us. Are you willing to jump into that? To six weeks, every Wednesday night. If you can't do six weeks, do five. If you can't do five, do four. If you can't do four, do three. If you can't do three, cancel your other stuff and do six. I don't care what you gotta do. <laughs> Get in there. Do you have any pattern of habit to be in the word of God? It's the old adage, adage garbage in, garbage out. If all your eyes and your ears are consuming is garbage. It's going to produce garbage. Back to the story. Matthew 4, 4, Jesus answered in one of his temptations, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. The word of God has power. It is life-giving. It is nourishment from our soul, for our soul. It is a pattern that you can get into that is a healthy pattern that will strengthen you spiritually. It's not about reading a book. It's about planting the voice of God on your heart and in your mind to discern truth, to repel temptation. Bible reading is an example. Sabbath is another example. We overlooked this one. Jesus practiced Sabbath but what's important to learn about Sabbath is we have to try to build rest into our schedule. Here's why it's important. Too many people operate out of exhaustion. We live in a world where work is, is a priority and family things are a priority and our kid things are a priority and everything is a priority. And pretty soon what's not a priority is your own physical and, and mental and spiritual capacity to deal with things. And we become, become exhausted. Many people operate, operate on of exhaustion and that's when, we, that's when it creeps in. Temptation will creep in when you're exhausted and tired and weak. 2017, I'm on year number seven. 2017 was a pivotal year for me. I went to Israel and I got a brand new perspective of, of Sabbath and I came back and every Friday I try to build in rest for me. Beth Ann and I, we, cel we celebrate a Sabbath. We don't just sit there and look at each other and read the Bible. We just rest from the world around us. It's built in a pattern. It's not more sleep. You can have as much sleep and be, and be rested your body. This is about rest for yourself, solitude with God. I want women to listen to this one too because you guys are, are, are often the ones who, who put more pressure on yourselves with the responsibilities or other people put pressures on you and expectations on you. It is a commandment of God. It's not, it's not a suggestion. It is a commandment that we rest. How foolish are we that we would not listen to that one? Sabbath is a wonderful practice of clearing your mind, of rejuvenating your spirit. Prayer. Prayer is a spiritual discipline that can build a healthy habit. Jesus did not retreat to pray because he was an introvert. 25 times in scripture it says Jesus prayed. Nine times it says Jesus went alone to pray, including in Matthew chapter 14, before he walked on water. We see this over and over in scripture. It says, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went on a mountainside to pray by himself. Prayer is more than asking for things. Prayer, prayer is about talking to God. Yes, prayer is about listening to God. Prayer is just about being with God. You have a, do you have a pattern of prayer? When do you pray? Is it only when you're in need? Is it when you're in crisis? Is it one way? 
Prayer is a spiritual discipline, a healthy habit to get into, to be in community with God. To give you perspective. There's times where I, you know, I love sports radio. When I'm in my car, that's what it's on. No more DVD players in my car. Sports radio, it's on. There's times in my day where I just shut off the radio in my car and I'm driving and that's my prayer time. Eyes open. Eyes open. You can pray with your eyes open. I give you permission to do that. But do you have, a, do you have a, a specific routine of prayer? Not that prayer becomes routine and they become meaningless words, but there, is there a pattern that you have built in to find community, connection with God, to bring your mind into focus of the things not of this world, but of spiritual? Simply doing that takes your mind off of the, the, the earthly things and brings it to a spiritual nature by being in a pattern of prayer. Fasting. Fasting without prayer is called a diet. Fasting is a wonderful spiritual discipline. You ever had a big decision to make? You ever had a big stressful thing that you're waiting for? Fasting is a wonderful spiritual discipline to remind you that God is in control and that you need support. That you're going to refrain. You're going to resist anything that is a temptation. Sometimes our greatest temptation is food. That we're going to pause And we're going to fast from those things to focus on spiritual things. Generosity is a spiritual discipline. Do you practice generosity? Not just giving. Generosity changes your heart because it's not about you. It's about sacrifice. It changes the perspective. Generosity is a wonderful, it's part of spiritual growth. It's not just about giving money. It's about sacrificing because you recognize that it's not all about you and putting something to the side for somebody else that you know belongs to God and that he's entrusted entrusted with you, right? One of the greatest temptations we have is when we got too much money or when when we just buy for ourselves. We can fall into the temptation of selfishness real easy. Make world about me. That's 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 a wonderful spiritual practice. Solitude. We talked about this a minute ago. There is goodness that comes from being alone sometimes, especially if you're married. To have time alone in solitude and rest. Community. Do you have a community around you? We talk about this one all the time. Community is important for connection. A community is important for accountability. These are all spiritual disciplines that we can practice that are healthy habits to help us fight off temptation. Serving is another one. It's not about volunteering. It's about giving, serving others, modeling Jesus, that we put others in front of us, that we care about the world around us, that we invest in people, that that we lift up the hurting, that we lift up the broken, that we lift up the oppressed. These are all patterns. And they start small. Anybody who knows me knows I love basketball, right? And, and, and when, I, when I say that, I am obsessed with basketball. Uh, but when, and one of my favorite players who's not a Detroit player is Steph Curry. And Steph Curry is, is an embodiment of pattern and habit. Steph Curry, when he entered the NBA, probably even before he entered the NBA, he developed a pattern to shoot 500 three-pointers a day. Every single day. No matter what he was doing, no matter what he felt like, every single day, Steph Curry, to this day, puts up 500 three-pointers a day. That is 3,500 three-pointers a week. That is 14,000 three-pointers a month. That is 168,000 three-pointers a year. That is over in his 15, now 16, maybe even 17-year career. That is now... 2.5 2.5 million three-pointers that Steph Curry has put up in his time practicing. Alan Iverson, practice, we're talking, about pra- we're talking about practice. Practice, not game time, practice. Steph Curry has built in a habit of every single day. You know how many three-pointers Steph Curry has shot in his career? I just looked it up right before I came out here. 8,800. 8,800 total three-point attempts in his career in game. 
That means that less than 1% of the shots that he's taken in a game are the amount of shots he's taken in practice. Less than 1%. But that small little practice every single day has developed in him what he would call muscle memory. It has become so natural that it looks effortless. It's become so natural that he's become the greatest shooter that our generation has ever seen, maybe anybody has ever seen. And it started because of a habit he developed. He practiced it so frequently, his mind doesn't even have to think about it. His body just reacts to it. Sometimes we're rewarded in public with what we practice in private. That's what we're talking about when we talk about spiritual disciplines. It might be just memorizing a, a one, one verse a month. It might just be practicing prayer every morning that you get up. Whatever it is, practicing one small, one small amount, one little bit builds and builds and builds until it turns, it turns into a good and healthy habit to replace the temptation. So here's the question. What has a stronghold grip on you? We've all got something. Paul told us that. We all struggle with something. We all keep defaulting back to something. Maybe it's food. Maybe it's what you're watching. Maybe it's what, it's putting in, what you're putting in your body. We all struggle. That's, that's the common thing we have together. The question is, what has a stronghold grip on you that you need to break? What is something that you know you have fought and you need to break today? Maybe it's a spirit that's inside you that's ugly. What are you, what are you gonna do today to break that, that habit? It's not about self-control, it's about spiritual control. It's not about just working harder. It's not just about you, hey, pulling up your bootstraps and saying no. We talked about this last week. It's about turning your eyes towards Jesus and saying, towards God and saying, man, I, I cannot do this. Help me clear my mind, renew my mind so that I can see something else and lead me out of temptation. It's been destroying me. It's been tearing me up. It's been hurting my family. And I need help. And the promise is God says, I will not abandon you. I will lead you out if you follow me. I will give you the strength to overcome. Keep turning back to me. Start doing the spiritually healthy thing. Start replacing it. And I promise you, over time, you will overcome it. I will be there. I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to walk you through it. So what is it for you? We're about halfway through Romans 12, 1 and 2. But this one is about resist. You have the strength and the power to resist. You do. There is nothing that is too strong uh, except the things that you give power to. You have the ability to resist temptation. Are you using that power? Are you calling on that power? Is that power within you? Let's pray. Father God, we just lift up this hour and this day, this moment where we all struggle. Temptation is, is not only real, it's present. And it ails all of us. And I get it. Temptation is, is, is not unique. And mine isn't greater than somebody else's, but sometimes the power of, that I give sin is. And so Lord, over, over all of those who are here today, over all those who are present and watching us right now, may we lift up that temptation, that, that the thing that's destructive or unhealthy or the pattern that we just need to break that's affecting not only us, maybe even the people around us, Lord, we just lift that up to you right now. We call on your name to help us resist. We call on your name to help us understand the healthy practices that we can, that you provide to draw closer to you. It takes away temptation's power. Lord, may we have the will every single day to call on your name to every single moment of our lives to resist. And when we fall victim, Lord, may we just get up, dust ourselves off and say, I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to come back to you again. Lord, in the silence, may you hear our temptation. May you 
call, may you hear the call for help. May we call right now and claim your authority over that you showed us that you have power over not only temptation, but sin. Lord, may we claim your power and may your spirit lead us away from temptation. Lord, it's, that's our prayer. And we lift up this, these prayers, ones who have been spoken, those that are, have not been spoken. Lord, we lift them up to you and may we glorify your name. May your name be lifted high. Lord, we need help. Strengthen us. It's in your name we pray.